Well, good morning, Saints. Today is December 16th, 2018. This morning, we want to continue our walk through the geography of Israel. If you hadn't noticed, that's exactly what each of these sermons are doing. Four weeks ago, we considered Mount Zion and Jerusalem as we shimmed the foundation. Three weeks ago, we considered Machpelah and Hebron as we fine-tuned the faith of Abraham. Two weeks ago, we considered Caesarea Maritime as we caught Israeli fire. Last week, we zeroed in on Bet Shein as we studied how Israel dealed with the very spirit of Bet Shein. Today, our journey is going to take us to the northernmost regions of Israel, into the foothills of Mount Hermon. We will be visiting Caesarea Philippi today in our message entitled, Negotiating Caesarea Philippi. Amen. We want to show you the word negotiating. We're, are you all excited about talking about Caesarea Philippi? Yeah. The reason we wanted to show you negotiate is there's a couple ways this word is used in the English language, and we're going to use them both ways today, and we don't want you to be lost. The most common is the first definition here that Google gave us. It's to obtain or bring about by discussion. Like when you go see Counselor Keith, and he negotiates for you a pardon. I hope you never have to do that. The second is like a mountain climber. When you negotiate your way through or over, an obstacle or a difficult path. You negotiate a mountain face. Does that make sense? Okay, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the Nevim. That's the prophets. You're going to be in the book of Joshua because we want to begin to warn you, to instruct you, and also to encourage your souls. Could you use some encouragement? Yes. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Say there when you're there if you're looking for some encouragement. Come on. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea. So you're in Joshua 14, verse 7, and uh, Pastor Matthew is uh, reading from that verse. I'm eager for some encouragement. <laughs> there, there we go. Okay. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions say convictions with me convictions. convictions there you go but my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear i however follow the lord my god wholeheartedly you know there are three things that you're going to hear repeatedly in this message about caleb's life and first one is uh different convictions say convictions again with me convictions, convictions. Different convictions than the other several million people that surrounded him at this time. Wow. So that's one. The second one, different heart. Say heart with me. Heart. He had a different heart than the other several million people that were around him. Third, different walk. Say walk with me. Walk. walk. A different walk than the other several million people that were around him. Now, if you look at your screen right now, it says, but my fellow Israelites. That's one way to say it. But in another translation, it says that my brothers. Well, it's different. It's one thing to say I'm a part of this group. It's another thing to call each other brothers, isn't it? Yeah. That has an entirely different connotation. Remember that Caleb was in the brotherhood. He was in a believing nation. The community of believers, the ecclesia, or the very church of his day. He wasn't just different from the world. That's the obvious part. He wasn't just different from the world. He was different than almost every other blood-bought, redeemed, delivered Israelite. Mm. Come on, let that sink in for just a minute. The idea that millions left Egypt. They were all covered under the blood. They were called. They were redeemed. They were delivered. They were brothers. But all of their hearts melted with fear, except for Caleb. You know, it's one of those things that dispensationalism has messed up for everyone. You tend to think without meaning to that Israel is in a different category than you are. You forget that they're bought under the blood of a lamb, that they were baptized in the Red Sea, that they followed the leading of the spirit in the desert and they were fed from heaven. Trust me, the righteous have always been saved by faith. There is no other way. Amen. It wasn't a different dispensation and they were not different. Faith looks today like it looked then. And the same perils that attack your faith then 
attack them now, we are not two different categories of people because of our time periods. In fact, the things that happen to them are warnings for us. So that begs the question, if in the days of Joshua and Caleb, the body of believers were different than they were, or rather they had a different spirit than the rest of the community of believers, do you really think that it's substantially different now? Now, Our hope is to inspire you today. Our hope is to strengthen you today. We want to see you put your feet on the rock of revelation of Jesus Christ in a brand new way today. Our hope is that you will be renewed in the promises God has given you. You'll be renewed in your will or your resolve. We hope to see your very mezuzah statement resurrected today. As we continue this topic, let's begin to read more about Caleb. Is that okay? I want you to hear some very specific things that he says because they're instructive to our life. So we're going to pick up in the 10th verse. Now then, just as the Lord promised, how important is it to know what the Lord has promised you? Not promised mankind in general, promised you. Not promised somebody you heard preaching once. Not promised you in the way that you see the scripture as a formula, so it must be mathematically true for you. Promised you. Most of this message is going to center around things that the Lord has or has not said To you. Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive. Him and the Bee Gees, right? They're staying alive. Put that into its context. What do you mean staying alive? Because every other Israelite died. He is the oldest man in Israel. Come on, somebody. That ought to make you feel better in the church, right? Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive 40 Five years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. Now, if you're pushing 85, you may not be the oldest man in the congregation or listening to us. But he's the oldest man because the others died from their unbelief. Wow, that can you imagine outliving everyone else? And watching them die off, it's something like it feels as a pastor to see people start in the faith and not finish in the faith. Looking around you and the families that you started with are no longer here. They all claimed they got some other vision, but the fruit of their life has shown that they didn't follow the Lord with intensity. We're beginning to get on the same page now. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous. Somebody say vigorous. Vigorous. To go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. Just as he said, you can hear in Caleb a kind of resurrection strength. He says he kept me alive because everybody else's faith and literally their bodies died around him. But something was strong and vigorous inside of him. One great question is why was he that way while all of the others were faithless? Not only did he have resurrection strength, but he had a holy confidence. Actually, I'm reminded of one of my own stones here in my back pocket. Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Do you realize that Caleb had 45 years between when the promise was made and this day that we're reading about here? He was just as strong and he was just as confident. It didn't didn't matter to him that 45 years had passed between the giving of the promise and now the potential fulfillment of the promise. Come on, that's some confidence. Turn to your neighbor and say, "That's that's confidence. How are we doing in this place with our confidence today? We have trouble making it 45 days from what God tells us to seeing it fulfilled. 
We start questioning. We start wondering. We start backing up. We start, you know, maybe the truth is, is we need a different heart like Caleb had here. He says, now give it to me. 45 years. Today is the day. Come on, give it to me, man. And he understands that this process of him getting the promise means that he now has to go fight at 85. Come on, how's your confidence today? You need to have a different heart like Caleb today. Amen. One of the other things that he had was a faith that was certain of the outcome. He says it in, I will drive them out. Not I'll try this out. I will drive them out. Come on, how many things have been put before us that God has ordained for us to go and conquer? And our first approach is, I'll I'll try to do it, Jesus. No, we have to have that different spirit, that different heart, that different walk that says, I will drive it out because I know the Lord is with me. It's kind of like being certain of what you don't see and sure in what you hope for. Amen. Caleb is definitely unique in the world. But he is not supposed to be unique in the kingdom. He is supposed to be the normative in the kingdom. When you are thinking about Caleb, I want you to put yourself in this sentence. Do you have different convictions than the other several million people, and hear me saints, among believers? Do you have a different heart than the other several million people who are believers? And lastly, do you have a different walk than the other several million people who are believers? Yeah, you know, I noticed not one person answered out loud. And the danger in that is that maybe you answered internally. Or maybe you thought, that's just a good question and you'll leave it unanswered. We don't want to leave you in that position. Let's assume that you said yes. Let's assume that you said maybe. Or like I heard in a Bible study the other night, a a real non-answer. Oh, I hope so. That's a way of avoiding the question altogether, isn't it? Yes. The real question for you is, do your convictions, do, does your heart, does your walk show up with resurrected strength? Are you just as vigorous about what the Lord told you in year one of your salvation today as you were then? Do you have a holy confidence? Are you walking in a way... That shows everybody around you, you are certain that God will bring about what he has promised. Or are you overcome with fear every time a new bill comes in the mail? Do you have the kind of faith that says the outcome is certain? I will never consider a different outcome than what the Lord has already said. See, this is what is meant when Abraham did not waver through unbelief. It is what is meant when Caleb says, I'm just as strong to go to battle now as then. Give it to me today. He had never been in a worse position. He had never had worse circumstances in the natural. And he was just as confident that day as he was the first day. You know, Daniel was a man like Caleb. He possessed the same qualities. I want to set the context of Daniel 1 as you turn there. Imagine that this nation has been conquered by another nation. Imagine that everything that you held dear was dismantled in front of your eyes. You had seen women raped in the streets, children dashed against rocks, pick up the child's feet, sling his head against a rock, and they're dying in front of you. That is the context of Daniel, the first chapter, and they are going into Babylon, the people who did it. That is what you're about to hear. In Daniel 1 and verse 8, say there when you're there. There. Read with me. Let this sink into your heart as we continue to read here today. But Daniel resolved. Everybody say resolved. 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 Not to defile himself with royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this manner. Come on, we're already seeing in Daniel that he's a man that had different convictions. Come on, when you talk about somebody who has resolve, does, does that start to bring certain pictures to your mind? A steely resolve, something that will not bend, that will not yield, that will not break. You will just continue to hold what God has given you. A deep conviction. It's almost like Daniel made this decision in advance, don't you think? Yeah. 
You do not have a conviction if you're making it on the spot. I can, if you're making that decision on the spot, you've already missed the idea of a conviction. Convictions are made long before you get into the trouble. You don't decide you're going to be holy when you're in the back seat of a car. You don't decide you're going to be holy when you have the mouse ready to click in your hand. That's not when you decide to be holy. You resolve yourself long, long before these moments get here. You resolve yourself. You have a conviction about these things way before. Come on, pastor. That's too... No, that's the minimum that you should have. Yeah. If you're going to have a different conviction than everybody else, well, we'll just kind of see how it goes. We're just going to live a little. We're just going to kind of get there and I'm sure I'll do the right thing. I'm sure I'll give my life for Christ if it should require it of me someday off in the future. See, there is a, a hint in this word resolve. You can resolve the melody in a song. Are you surprised I know that? That was good. My wife sings. I, I don't really want to leave you with all of the music examples. <laughs> That's exactly. You can resolve a math problem. There are a lot of kinds of resolve. The kind of resolve we're talking about here that says if it costs the, white, my, the life of my wife, if my children were dashed to pieces against the stones, if I am executed publicly, I have already decided what the outcome is because I have heard from God. Amen. Now, don't tell me you know many people who demonstrate that kind of resolve. You know many people who say they have that kind of resolve. But the truth is, is if their alarm clock goes off a little late, they don't have enough resolve to get to church, much less this kind of resolve. Mm -hmm. We must learn from, like Daniel, not to wait until we get to the table of the enemy to negotiate. We can't negotiate this deep conviction. If you wait to be resolved, if you wait to have conviction, you've already lost and you just don't know it. Daniel had a different heart. He said, I don't want to defile myself. I can't do this. I know that this is the plan. I know that everyone else... Literally everyone else is doing this, but I cannot. I have something inside of my heart that I cannot defile myself this way. I want to have a different walk. With all these deep convictions, with this different heart that he had, you know what he did? He asked permission to not defile himself. What a bold walk that he had. I'm sure that if you ask the other Israelites, if they had the same type of thoughts, if they had the same convictions and heart and walk, many, many of the millions would have said, of course we do. They would have agreed with Daniel. But it's easy to believe these things that are right while you're not doing them. Only three men in all of Israel joined Daniel in his convictions of resolve, in his heart to not be defiled, and his walk to do something that the Lord had in fact instructed him to do. Somebody say, that's resolve. That's resolve. I want you to notice as we read the next part of this passage, that Daniel is able to negotiate difficult terrain without renegotiating his stated conviction. See, that's important. That's what Pastor Wade is talking about when he says, if you wait to sit at the table of the enemy to develop your conviction, then you don't have any. You need to decide, not in your mind, you need to have heard from God ahead of time about where you're going to stand or you don't stand at all. Look at verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid. Yeah, you are. Everybody in the world is afraid. It's a man that has deep-seated godly convictions that is able to overcome that fear. The official... Say the official. the official, the guy in charge is afraid of my Lord, the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would then have my head because of you. In other words, Daniel, the conviction you're asking me to allow you to test is going to cost me something. Yeah, convictions always do. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please, somebody say it out loud, please, 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 please test your servants for 10 days. Are you kidding me? How many of you have ever stood up and said, please test me? In school from the very beginning, you hated a pop quiz. You agonized over test. Nobody wants to be tested because you're scared you don't have what it takes.
But the kingdom of God puts convictions in a man that says, I know that God has given me what it takes. Please test me. Because when you test me, you're going to find something out not only about me, but about my God. And it will show you something about you too. Come test me. Give us nothing but vegetables. That statement takes more faith than any in the Bible. Like we said, test me. No keto, no Atkins, no carnivore, no paleo. Give me vegetables. Give me testosterone killing vegetables. Daniel probably didn't have to shave for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare. Come on now. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. And treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. See, Daniel's convictions were not up for negotiation. He put himself out there for the test. That's resurrection strength. The kind of resurrection strength that says, you cannot feed me for 10 days. You cannot give me what they get. And you know what? When you come back to compare me with the others, you're going to find something out. There is resurrection power inside of me. That's a conviction he had on his way into the enemy's camp. A conviction that attacks the enemy's camp. This is the holy confidence that you see in Daniel that gives him enough confidence to say, why don't you compare me? Not only test me as if if I'm going to accomplish it on my own. It's one thing to be tested. It's another thing to see how you have to measure up against someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and compare me with everyone else around. You go ahead and do it. I'm going to lay it on the line here. I'm going to say that I have confidence in my God. I have confidence in this resurrection strength that comes from these deep convictions. My heart can handle the comparison here. You go ahead and compare me. He's not comparing. I invite the comparison. Well, that's a holy confidence. That's confidence. Boy, if you had to stand up here and say, go ahead, church. Not only test me, but compare me to someone else. How would you do today? Are you ready to be tested? Are you ready to be compared? Or have you let your convictions wane? Have you let your heart become just like everyone else? Is your walk, are you just limping along? We are here today to encourage you to lift this church, to raise your faces and raise your heads up to the heavens and say, you can have the convictions that come from hearing from God. You can't talk about having a different heart and continue to live like everyone else. There has to be proof in this pudding. Why don't you compare our lives? Mm. Come on, who needs a deep-seated Holy Ghost conviction given to them today? Come on, we're talking to you this morning. Another facet is that he had a faith. That says the outcome is certain in this statement. Treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Sometimes I have heard of people playing a game called poker. (laughs) And in poker you have a bet. And then you can either fold, match that bet, or raise it. He was so certain. And had a deep-seated Holy Ghost conviction. He said, I'll see your one and I'll add three. He spoke for the lives of his brothers in addition to himself. Come on, that is a deep-seated Holy Ghost conviction. Amen. Come on, husbands, isn't that what you're really doing every day, though? Aren't you really placing your bet yeah. for you and those that are attached to your family? That's exactly what we're doing, whether we realize it or not. God, we have to have these convictions, this confidence, this faith. Look at verse 15. It says, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Come on, this is the result of having different convictions, a different heart, a different walk, that these four Israelites, come on, somebody say, look at your neighbor and say, final four. Final Final four. four. That these four Israelites had. But where do these things come from? How do they operate in holy confidence, resurrection strength, and a faith that knows the outcome is certain? Are these just heroes to be admired? Or does God expect this from every man and woman and child in this room today? Mm. 
Be careful how quickly you say yes. How many in a generation does God get this from? Millions who will say it. But maybe a final four of those who can actually carry it out. Where do your strength, confidence, and certainty of the outcome, where, does those th- where do those things come from? Again, a question asked, met with deadpan faces in silence. And I understand, you're probably just a little bit insecure now. Let's get the charismatic Pentecostal answer out of the way. Is that okay? If you happen to be in here and you're a cessationist, you'll love this part of this message. You're wrong, but you'll love this part of the message. The spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostal answer, it's true, but it's only half of the truth, and I want to warn you about that in advance. It's found in Numbers 14 and beginning in verse 24. Say there when you're there. There. One of you is there. Where do these things come from? But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the road to the Red Sea. Did you hear that Caleb had a different spirit? Well, that's the easy, charismatic, drop-down menu answer. Oh, I know. I know why Caleb did it. Caleb was filled with the Spirit. I know why Daniel did it. Daniel was filled with the Spirit. And the thing is, I'm filled with the Spirit too. Well, consider that this says Caleb had a different spirit. Different than the world. But how is Caleb different from other spirit-filled believers in his community. Isn't that worth asking? He said, no, 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 Eric, you, you got this wrong. Caleb was different because he's the only one God's moved on in this way. Really, there weren't 70 elders that were filled with the Spirit of God and prophesied. There were not other men that were moved by God's Spirit. You know that there were. It is not the baptism in the Holy Spirit alone that makes you different from others in this room right now we have many people who are spirit filled but the difference in their depth of conviction love for the lord and daily obedience is extraordinary you'll be in daniel 4 my friend let's go to daniel 4 verse 18 Say there when you're there. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now Belshazzar, tell me what it means. For none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Among all in the kingdom, including those that were Israelites taken captive. Daniel had a different spirit. He was able to be on on call, on duty, to give what no one else could give. We need a different spirit from the world. Daniel had a different spirit from the community of believers. If you are spirit-filled, how do you get a different spirit? Is it possible that Daniel was the only person on whom God's spirit moved in his day? Where, Where are the other Israelites when he is the one inside the lion's den. Isn't that worth thinking about? Were there not other people that God had moved on? What is it about Daniel that puts him alone in the lion's den? What is it about Caleb that makes him and Joshua alone ready to take the land? They had all seen and experienced the same things. I'm all for the baptism in the Spirit. I've been preaching it for more than 25 years. I speak in tongues every single day. And I am... Not ashamed to say I speak in tongues more than most of you. I desire also the greater gifts. Raise your hand in this church if I've personally prophesied to you over the last few decades. So we're not talking about being against the baptism in the Spirit. What I'm saying is being baptized in the Spirit does not give you the kind of 
different spirit from the rest of the community that describes Caleb. To be spirit-filled is great. How many people do you know that are spirit-filled that have none of the qualities that we're talking about? You can be spirit-filled because of God's mercy and the teachings of other godly men. That's like being splashed from a heavenly source, but that's not the same as being tapped into a heavenly source. Come on, let's dig into this thought just a little bit more. How is it that a spirit-filled man can't lead his wife rightly? That can't attend church faithfully? I'm willing to die for you, Lord. You can't even get to church. Can't stay free from porn or other addictions more than 60 days at a time. Come on now. How is it that a godly woman can constantly fall into depression? Stop and think about that for a minute. These examples came from this body, not somebody else's. How is it that godly, spirit-filled women can be in a constant state of manipulating their husbands to get what they want? How is it that they fall prey to fear unchecked on any given day? Or have fits of rage and anger? Or just overall fail to follow their husbands? How is it that those things can be happening to our body here in this room? But we credit ourselves with different convictions than the rest of the uh, the believers. With a different heart. We have a different heart. We have different convictions. We have a different walk. Do we? Maybe the question isn't do we. The question is do you? How among the spirit-filled community do you end up with a different spirit that is shown in resurrection strength, confidence, and an outcome that is certain? It turns out that the foundation of all of their actions, Caleb, Daniel, flows from the foundation of the Torah. Their different convictions, their different hearts, their different walks, their resurrection strength, holy confidence and faith that the outcome is certain all come from one tapped source. We're going to read about that in Genesis 22. Let's have every person in the church go to Genesis 22. This is not the kind of message that you're going to want to hear and walk out the same way that you walked in. In Genesis 22, we're going to pick up in verse 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from... Where did he call to him from? Heaven. Where did he call to him from? Heaven. See, he didn't call to him from a pulpit. He didn't call to him from a Bible study in someone's home. He didn't call to him from street evangelism. Where did he call to him from? Heaven. Heaven. What have you heard from heaven? See, we're in the habit of repeating what other men have heard from heaven. We're in the habit of evaluating people's teaching and deciding that we approve or disapprove. That's not where convictions come from. You can agree with someone's teaching and sit at the table of the enemy and renegotiate the teaching. It wasn't your teaching. When you have heard something from heaven, when your ears have had that experience, you're not at the mercy of the devil's argument anymore. You no longer are negotiating because you personally have been told from God where you stand. But far too many settle for something far less than that. You are content to run on somebody else's passion. You are content to be fired by their flame when their passion and their flame were supposed to be like starter fluid for you to personally hear from heaven. See, when you have not heard from heaven, you cannot withstand hell. But when you have heard from heaven, then hell cannot withstand your furious attack. Amen. Amen. He heard from heaven a second time. Wow. See, it occurred again and then again. Some of you have heard from heaven when you were born again, but that was the last time you heard from heaven. So you don't know where to stand when a holiday comes. You don't know where to stand when a test comes. You kind of hope that you'll never be in one instead of begging to be tested because you've heard about the outcome already. Come on. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, your son, your only son, his only hope that the promise would ever come true, his only heir, 
Man, one of the most idolatrous things in our lives is often the work that we hope to do for the Lord. You build a church, you build a Bible study, you build a reputation, you build a family, and then you kill, covet, lie, slander to try to protect what you have built. God required of him to take the only way in which he could ever hope that this would work out up to a mountain and put it to death. There'd have to be some kind of strong conviction in there. I will bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Who in this room wants to stand and argue the fact that Abraham's convictions are different than almost everybody you've ever known in Christianity. How many people would even consider that it was possible that God would tell you to put to death the one way in which His promise could come about? See, most of our faith is limited completely to what we can reason out, and therefore it's not much faith at all. The book of Hebrews is so clear about where Abraham's conviction is. His conviction is, since God said that I would get this land with the seeds from my own body, that we would get it together, if God has asked me to kill him, then God will raise him from the dead. His conviction was not even death could stop the promise of God from coming about, so he was not scared to risk it all. Faith that doesn't risk everything is not worth anything. He held nothing back. Somebody say nothing back. Nothing back. Not even the very thing that the Lord had promised him. If the Israelites are going to be like stars in the sky, as the verse said, then Abraham is a superstar. (laughs) What an incredible thought. What, What are the superstars in our world made of? Zero conviction and whatever talent that the Lord may have given them. Abraham is a superstar in the faith because of these deep deep convictions, this different convictions, this different heart, this different walk that he had. His resurrection strength, his confidence in the holiness of God and the certainty of the outcome all show that Abraham actually has the different spirit that we're talking about today. Where did he get it? The undeniable answer is that he heard from God. I want to talk to you about that. I'm uncomfortable in any way demeaning the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Because when the baptism in the Holy Ghost works right, you are tapped into a source. The problem is what we have accepted as the baptism in the Holy Ghost is that you have an experience with the Holy Spirit. Instead of a continual washing, a continual rebirth, a continual empowerment, a clothing with power from on high. See, there's an extraordinary difference between having tasted of a heavenly gift and having heard from God a promise for your life that is no longer negotiable. See, I know the difference between people who are spirit-filled and love the Lord and they can be full of power and men who have actually heard the voice of God. Because I've heard the voice of God. The very work that you're standing in came because a scared 18-year-old boy heard the voice of God. And you know what? Defections from mentors, friends that went the other way, moving, families, departing, my own family, turning it did not cause me to back up even an inch because it was not negotiable anymore. When you have heard from heaven, it is no longer a negotiation. It is a test of God's will in you. See, being Spirit-filled is only as useful as you are obedient to the Spirit you have been filled with. When we say different Spirit, Caleb didn't have a different kind of Holy Spirit. He didn't have a different measure of the Holy Spirit. Neither did Daniel, and neither did Abraham. You know whose Spirit was different? Theirs. Their Spirit yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. You know what? It's very hard for you to show faith in something that you haven't heard. And if your walk is made up of imitating the teachings of others, that's a great start. But you'll never stand in great persecution. 
You have to hear from God yourself. That's where convictions come from. Most of the time, I'm not interested in the arguing points of theology with people. Most of the time. Sometimes I get drawn into it. The reason that I'm not is they're repeating what they have read, and I am telling you where my God-ordained conviction has come from. See, I didn't go find it in a book. It was revealed to me. And where I don't have a revelation, I try not to state things dogmatically. The hope is you will be inspired that you can hear from heaven. It comes with a great, great promise. Come on, let's look at that promise. It was Abraham who was given the promise that his seed would possess. Say with me, possess. Possess. The cities of their enemies. We'll have a slide for you about this word possess. Strong's number 3423. Yaris. A verb meaning to take possession. To inherit. Hear this, saints. To dispossess. Mm. To drive out. The very bottom. This word is usually in connection with the idea of conquering the land. We have a responsibility, and that is to have a different spirit that comes from hearing the very voice of God. In that hearing, we will hear the promises of what we are called to be, and therefore called to what to do. Then we must act on what God has already said. And that first step is to put this verb into action in our own lives. What are we not taking possession of that God has said to take possession of? Anything other than taking possession of it is a lack of faith and ultimately disobedience. That taking possession then leads to the next thing. A determination to make it my inheritance. Yeah. Come on, I see this in children's church all the time. There's these wonderful little toys that are sitting all around the room. And one looks across the room and sees something he wants to take possession of runs over and before he gets there someone else swoops in and grabs it now we have some pastoral moments that need to happen between our kids there's that determination in the first one to make that toy their inheritance Uh, how much more are we to take that tenacity and attach it to the promises of god that come from the voice of god and make the things that god has promised us our inheritance that we are to possess Finally, what that will result in is that when you are taking possession, when you are locked in on what God has promised you, you will drive out anything that stands between you and the possession of it. That means every thought that comes through your mind, every attitude of your heart that is contrary to the nature and to the word of God, you are crushing and killing because there is something to be fought for and to be won. When you think about the men that we've already mentioned, somebody like Caleb, he took possession of a promise before he took possession of the land. So he inherited the land because he possessed that promise. Because he possessed a promise and he saw it as his inheritance that he would not be denied, he dispossessed everything that shouldn't be there. Daniel does the same thing. He decides that his possession, that he is God's possession, and he's not going to defile it because he wants his heavenly inheritance. He wants the kingdom of God. So he dispossesses any thought that he will yield to this enemy. See, these men had convictions. This verse about Abraham, it doesn't say, though, that they, he will simply possess. It says he will possess something very specific. The NIV says cities... Of his enemies. That word city is Strong's number 8179 and it is Sha'ar. The New American Standard got it right when they said gate. This thing that you possess when you have heard from God is the gate of your enemy. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. Some of you might even be fast forwarding to Caesarea Philippi and what was said there. But a long time before anything was said at Caesarea Philippi, Psalm 9 spoke of the gates of death. Genesis 19, Lot sat in the gates of Sodom. And Micah 2, the Lord himself was coming to break open a gate before you. And in Revelation 21, the city of God has gates that will never be shut. A gate is the administrative center of the city. It's the stronghold of the city. In other words... 
It's every attack, every authority, every scheme of the enemy Abraham would possess. He would disinherit the enemy. He would dispossess the enemy. Saints, are you living with less than you're supposed to have spiritually? Have you settled for the passion of some other man? Are you living on the convictions of others? Let me give you a good example. Hey, what should we do in Christmas? I know a lot of it is not so. What, what should we do? Well, I want you to have good teaching. I want you to have that. But why do you not have a conviction about what you should do? What should we do with Halloween? Why do you not have that conviction? Why are you waiting for somebody else to give it to you? Why must someone else tell you where you must stand? It's your feet that have to be there. It's you that will have to be good with it. See, the community of believers is there for you to test your convictions against. The, the community of believers is there so that you will have some concept of orthodoxy. Am I getting this right? It was not there to substitute for your personal convictions. Some people don't like what I eat. They like even less what I drink. And some hate what I light on fire. Can I tell you I love you and don't care about that at all? You can not like that I'm not like that. I'm getting thinner, not like that I wear boots, that I have a beard. You know what? You have to stand on your convictions. Do you have them? See, when a man has heard from God, he can withstand the criticism of his peers. He can withstand the enemy. Because he stands where God told him to stand. Most of what, and hear me. Most of what you call convictions are actually just teachings you accepted. You no more heard from God than a man on the moon. You are just saying that sounds right to me. It, it, it agrees with my heart. What we're going to read about in Matthew 16 is a man that went well beyond that. Like Abraham. See, Abraham was on a mountain that rested upon the hope of a resurrection of a son. And Abraham got a revelation and he could attack the very gates of his enemies. Now let's go to Matthew 16 and verse 13. Say there when you are there. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, hey guys, what's commonly being said about me? That's an interesting question, isn't it? I want to show you a short video that just gives you an idea of what the region looks like, where he's at. It's probably where he was standing. There's no sound in the video. It's less than 60 seconds long. This is a series of caves and a backdrop to the foothills of Mount Hermon. There are three springs right here that form the Jordan River. It's the Dan, the Hot Panai, and the Panias. And um, this particular structure has unique significance in the word. And we're going to show you that. I just wanted you to see what the area looked like first. We're standing on a plateau when this is filmed. And this is likely the plateau that Jesus stopped on. Let's move to our very next slide, if you don't mind, Joy. While we're looking at this slide, this is an artistic impression of what it looked like in Jesus' day. And what you're seeing right here to the left is the temple to Pan. Right when Jesus says, who do people say the Son of Man is, on the left, there is a uh, demonic stronghold, a temple to a god that had a giant phallus that they sacrificed virgins on. Right behind it, something even more sinister happened. But on the left, what we see is the idolatry of self-gratification and sensuality. Right in the center is the temple to Augustus Caesar. This would be the culture of the day. Immediately to your right, what you see is the foundation for a temple to Zeus. This would be the accepted religion of the day. This is the spot that Jesus says, hey, who do people say that I am? 
And before we get to their answers, you need to know that these structures here were not built by Israelites. But within Israel, for as long as anybody could remember, this area had been associated with Canaanite worship. In fact, in the Older Testament, it's called Baal Gad. In other words, the tribe of Gad, this is where they worship Baal. In the cave that is on the left that we were showing the video of, the Greeks, when they came in and saw the Canaanites worshiping there and Israel occupying the land around, they saw a river that went into this. Eusebius tells us in the second century, and there are older writings than that, that they threw their babies into the spring. And the babies would be carried along by the water and dashed to pieces against the rocks and then disappear. Then they would run to the foothills and see if blood came out. If blood came out, then the offering wasn't accepted. If blood didn't come out, then the underworld had received their live child sacrifice. This is the gates of hell in the Greek mind. An abortion mill of their day. The very gates of hell. This is the place that Jesus says, hey, what are people saying that I am? So right there you have an abortion mill and the idolatry of sensuality. Right in the center, you have the cult of Augustus Caesar. Now Augustus means the revered one. His birth name was Octavian. And Augustus Caesar became the heir to Julius Caesar. He was his nephew. And the reason that he became the heir is it was said that Caesar ascended into heaven when a man saw a comet cross the sky. It was Caesar going into heaven after he was killed. This made his heir a son of God. Augustus Caesar was worshipped as the son of God right here. Do you know that his priest were the only priest in the ancient world that you could pay money to and they could absolve you of sin? Anybody know when Augustus Caesar's birthday was? How about that? Celebrated every December with 12 days of gift giving. This was the cult of Augustus Caesar. I don't have time to teach you about the temple to Zeus that was here. You probably have already heard about Zeus. My point is, this is the backdrop that Jesus took 16 to 22 year old men up to this place. And he said, hey, by the way, while you're looking behind me and seeing these things, who do people say that I am? See, it's in the context of our culture that we have to develop convictions that came from heaven that stand up to the culture, that defeat the culture. That overtake the culture. Culture can't determine your convictions. Heaven has to determine your convictions. Amen. Another man's teaching can't determine your convictions. Heaven has to determine your convictions. Look at where Jesus goes with this. It begins in verse 14. Verse 14 says, They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. These men are repeating the opinions and the teachings of others. In this context, they're taken aback in front of a temple to the Son of God. The actual Son of God is speaking to them. With the lasciviousness that's all around them. And they begin repeating the opinion and the teachings of others. Boy, isn't that what most believers do today? Have very few thoughts of our own. We're just repeating what the sages on the stages have told us our whole life. Jesus continues to address this with them. What Jesus is addressing to this body in the next verse is asking you the same question he asked them. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? This is the beginning of a conviction, a heart, a walk that is different even from your peers. When a man is heard from heaven, he is able to stand up to the world that is around him. One of the clear signs that somebody is standing on a conviction that did not come from heaven is when it wavers every other month. So one of the things that you can do to test to see whether or not you got an actual word from God 
Number one, is it consistent with every other word from God you ever got? So if the Lord told you for sure you were to be in this church, if he spoke to you and you left wherever you were at and you came and you dedicated yourself here, how could you ever leave it without God telling you that you must leave? And if God told you, then why does your wife need to constantly reassure you? You carry this forward and what you find out is that every real conviction worth having, it came from heaven. And it has a kind of resurrection strength that goes with it. It so changes the heart that it enters into a man's soul so that it could be said he has a different kind of spirit. It gives you a confidence that if nobody else is with you, it's okay. God is with you. This is not mealy mouth, weak hearted husbands that are following their children's desires. These are men of God that have heard from God and nobody can sway them. I'm not talking about encouraging rebellion. I'm talking about encouraging submission to the one true king. Amen. So many people don't get this right. You were put into a body of believers so that you had something to judge your convictions against. So that you had other men and women that you respected that you could go, this is what I believe I heard from heaven. Tell me, do you think I'm on the right track? And your confidence begins to grow and it turns into a walk. And that conviction that you are walking out says the outcome is certain and I cannot be dissuaded. But let's just be honest. Haven't we all thought we heard things from God and we were wrong? Yes. Yes. If you can't answer yes to that, then you're juvenile in the faith. Because anybody that's ever walked with the Lord for a while can look back and go, I clearly got that wrong. That means that we work out our salvation with fear and intrepidation. You invite correction. You invite a rebuke. If what you have is really of God, It won't be uprooted because somebody else is discouraged by it. It'll actually grow in your life like that rock that was prophesied about today. Like the rock that has just been spoken about. Of the rock that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. How many of you think Peter was that rock? Good. No Catholics in the group. The idea that any man is a rock is ridiculous. Mm. Ladies... You say your husband is amazing, and you should. If you're not saying that, correct yourself now. And you've been there when he wasn't quite the rock that he needed to be. Men, you know that's true. You've been there when macho bravado failed. You've you've been there when your resolve failed. There is no man that is a rock. The same guy that Jesus looks at and says, Peter, you're a rock. Peter says, we come to him, the living stone. Peter is only a rock to the extent that he's standing inside of Christ. Caleb is only a rock to the extent that he's standing inside the revelation God gave him. Daniel is only a rock as long as his resolve is coming to him from heaven. You're only a rock to the extent that you're standing in the will of God. But man, when you stand in the will of God, the outcome becomes certain. The beginning of everything that we're talking about is the foundation. It's the rock. It's the bedrock of the Torah itself. Men like Abraham can actually hear from God and obey. That's so distinctly different from merely obeying the teaching that's around you or merely speaking in tongues or merely fellowshipping in community, which are all good and absolutely necessary. But it does not make you like Abraham. It does not make you like Caleb. It does not make you like Daniel. And the truth is, is we're going to find out how Peter responds to this in the next passage, in the next verse. But it's one thing to think about Peter responding this way because you and I are going to have to be able to do exactly what Peter does here. Exactly what Peter is about to show us is what you and I must do. Amen. Let's look at verse 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In this statement, Peter is not repeating the teaching of others. He didn't open up his laptop and look at PC Study Bible. He didn't YouTube for who had the latest and greatest answer to this question. Peter's not reasoning out truth. He's not logically deducing of what the answer should be to the question asked to him. Peter's not asking his wife. That's right. Peter was married. (laughs) 
how he should answer. As for all you Catholic guys out there. But he wasn't abdicating his own personal responsibility to hear from God to those that he's supposed to lead with the convictions of God. Peter heard from God, and that is where real convictions come from. Verse 17 says what Matthew has been saying. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. That doesn't mean at all that good things were not revealed to Peter by man at other times. That good teachings were not revealed. But this bedrock of his life came from heaven, nowhere else. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The kind of revelation that produced the conviction in Peter is the kind that overcomes the gates of hell. In every manifestation, whether it is pan in sensuality, or it is the culture of your day worshiping Augustus Caesar, or it is the religion of your day worshiping Zeus, the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, spoken to you from heaven, dictates your response to everything else. It gives you resolve. It strengthens you with resurrection power. Yes. Now, when this was given to Abraham... It was in the context of the resurrection. When it was given to Daniel, it was in the context of the resurrection. He went without food, and ten days later he was better. When it was given to Caleb, it's in the context of the, rev- of the resurrection. He is 85 years old and just as strong. Well, right here, when he gets this revelation, Peter, and he develops this conviction, the next thing Jesus tells him is that he'll be crucified. You know, that was difficult for Peter. Your convictions will fall to a place where it feels like they're dead at times. Where it feels like you have so failed, where you cannot make it. And God will resurrect them in you. And it's proof that they were born of God and not of men. Amen. Why is Peter considered a leader? Well, it's very quiet again. Peter is called a hakam in Hebrew, a lead disciple. But why? Why is Peter the standout leader in the first 10 chapters of Acts by far, even though he was leading in community? Why is Peter the one always to answer questions? Why is Peter the most rebuked? Why is Peter in the forefront? Some say it's because he's the oldest. Others would say, no, it's his personality. He's he's the boldest. They picture kind of a burly fisherman who just couldn't keep his mouth shut. Those are all carnal, reasoning answers. You know why Peter was the leader? He's the only one of the twelve that has heard from God himself. So he's not scared to speak. He's not scared to try. And he can withstand correction because he's actually heard from God. Amen. He's not some kind of weak, mealy mouthed disciple. He's an actual Talmudim of the Son of God. Amen. This is why conviction defeats the gates of hell. This is why conviction stands against the gods of this world. You don't renegotiate your convictions that you heard from heaven. Not now, not ever. Amen. Can, you feel, can you hear what we're trying to encourage you today? You need to hear from God. You have got to hear from God. These men had the revelation. Peter had this revelation here. And in the very next chapter, they even get further revelation. It continues to grow as they ascend Mount Hermon. And Jesus reveals Himself in a glorified, in a transfigured manner. They see a transfigured Christ. They see Moses and Elijah. What are they seeing? They're seeing the embodiment of the law right there before them in Moses. They're seeing the embodiment of the prophets in Elijah. And they are seeing the embodiment of the writings, how to walk these things out in its perfect form right there in Jesus Christ. That's what revelation from the, from the heavens does to you. 
It opens your eyes and you begin to get more revelation. And it deepens your convictions that much more. It gives you different convictions. A different heart. A different walk that you might stand in strength. They needed these different convictions. So that they might have the resurrection strength that they needed. That they might have a holy conviction and a faith that the outcome is certain. That's exactly what we need today. And don't you tell me that it's not. You need faith that the outcome is certain. Say certain. Certain. Is that the way you feel about the things that you are engaging in in your life? Are you certain that they will come forth? Mm. Only in the things that you've heard from the heavens can you be that certain. Peter's known for a lot of things. And mainly what comes to mind are his failures. But this holy conviction from the heavens that he received was going to carry him through that also adds to his reputation success. In the same way that Peter failed but found a resurrected faith that elevated the revelation, so too we can see our older bloodline brother demonstrate the same pattern for us. In the same way that Peter had his confidence restored, so too Israel will be restored, and you as well. In the same way that Peter had his faith renewed, resurrected, so much that healings happen as his shadow passed by, so too the same will happen with Israel and you as well. That's such a strong connection, and I'm not sure you're getting it. Peter is known for having denied Christ, is he not? Yes. How many times? Three. Three. And yet, his shadow is healing people chapters later. So an Israelite that denied Christ, it gets so full of the Spirit of Christ that his very shadow is healing people. Don't tell me there's no hope for the other Israelites. Any Israelite who is trusting in the God of heaven can receive the revelation that Peter got. And even if you want to say Peter failed... Understand it was a temporary stumbling. The nation has not failed. The nation has had a temporary stumbling. And they will again be the standout leaders of the world. The Bible promises this. And the encouraging part about that is if God did it in Peter. And he can do it in a whole nation. If he did it in Peter in a matter of months. And he does it in a nation over thousands of years. You're somewhere in between that spectrum. He can do it for you too. The last thing that God told you to do is the most important thing that God will ever tell you to do. So what do you mean by that? Well, Caleb, after 40 years, was still hanging on to the very last thing that God said to do. In the charismatic Pentecostal church, you're always looking for something new to do and you haven't done the last thing that he told you to do. The reason that you want him to tell you something new is you didn't like your last assignment. You've decided not to do it. And so if you can make up something else that you say he told you to do, you feel like you're being obedient while you're wholly disobedient. Caleb held on to that promise for 40 years. It got harder every year. There were still giants in it when he took it. They were at elevation in Hebron. He had to climb a mountain at 85 years old and kill three men that had scared off an entire nation of men. But he was not about to leave undone the last thing that God told him to do. There's no record of God speaking to Caleb at any other point. So you think you hear from God every week, and I really hope you do. That makes you about 52 times more spiritual than your pastors. But I hope you hear from God every week. But what good is it if you didn't do what He told you to do in week one? Mm. Complete what He has told you to do before moving on to some other conviction. Number two, make sure that the conviction that you think from heaven is both selfless and risk everything. If it has selfish gain in it, you'll never know whether it came from heaven or from you. Have you never gerrymandered a response from the Lord? I remember driving down the road, seeing a pickup and saying, you know, if it's there when I come back, I'll know the Lord wants me to buy it. I, of course, had to sell it three months later. Right? The convictions that come from heaven tend to cost you everything that you have, including your reputation. They risk it all. So if you've been grumbling at home and you think the church is the source of your grumbling because when you come here, it challenges you and that's causing fights and you feel led to relieve that pressure by going to some circus somewhere, 
I doubt that's a conviction that came from heaven. It's not selfless, it's selfish. It doesn't risk anything except your salvation. Thirdly, make sure that when you believe you've heard from heaven, it's consistent with every other thing that ever came from heaven. See, God does not contradict himself. He didn't tell Caleb, you're going to get that land and then change his mind because circumstances changed. If your new conviction replaces something that God already told you, you have to be wrong about one of them. And you need to stand up and own it. See, you can't say now God has changed his mind. You make God a schizophrenic to protect your reputation. Mm -hmm. What he has said to you, number one, do. Make sure that it's selfless and that it risks something. And number three, it cannot contradict what he has already told you or what you think he already told you was clearly wrong and you need to admit it. But you don't get to have it both ways. That's right. This is how you form a character in a spirit that is different from the majority of the community of believers. Because the majority of the community of the believers is immature and you are called to mature. And very few do it. In fact, Jesus said the love of most, say most, most. most. will grow cold. Thank God for Caleb that didn't go wrong when the whole nation went wrong. Thank God for Daniel, who not only stood up for what was right, but brought three brothers with him out of an entire nation. And thank God for Peter that endured more correction than anybody else in the scripture, but rose to greater heights than anyone else because he heard from heaven. Amen. I want to praise this church. This word is intense. I know it's intense. We're dealing with real life and death issues, and I'm concerned. But I want to praise men and women in here. I'm thinking about John and Joy at the moment. John and Joy have been in this ministry for almost 12 years. They came out of bankruptcy and near divorce. And I've never seen a couple that was more united than they are. Amen. There was a time period when their greatest desires were withheld from them. They didn't have a home of their own, and they didn't have a family of their own. But because they had a conviction from heaven, because John and Joy together heard from God that they would have a child, and they would have a home, they labored for seven years. Girls, that's a lot of cycles. Seven years. And the conviction of heaven made their outcome as certain as the promise that was given to them. I was there the day that God spoke to them and the day that God fulfilled His Word. And today their home is a discipleship house and they're raising up natural and supernatural heirs. That's the stuff that is made of heaven right there. As pastors, we find the joy of seeing potential in every single one of you. And even greater joy as you begin to act on what is required in discipleship to bring that, that potential forward. I want to point out Marlon and Lena. I've had a little bit of time to spend with these guys. And they have such a deep call and gifting to go after the things of God. Marlon is coming to me week after week with questions that show he's getting heavenly revelation. He's devouring discipleship helps in pursuit of signing his name on the Acts class. If you have a chance, spend some time with Marlon and Lena. They are a precious couple, and they are definitely an anchor member in this church. Another family that's growing in their deep convictions here are Tom and Martha. Yeah. Man, I love Tom and Martha. If you guys haven't gotten a chance to get with them, they are a couple that is learning how to walk in deep convictions, that the God of all creation is giving them a different heart and a different walk. They are finding resurrection strength a holy conviction, and a faith that can assure them in their outcome. God is moving in our midst. You know, as we say these things, as we say these encouragement things, I want to I focus on a few things as we get ready to close here. In Revelation chapter 11, we have an interesting story about two witnesses. These two witnesses are great men. We, won't, we, we don't have the time to go into this in depth, but I, I want to bring out two verses to you. In Revelation chapter 7, and uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11 and verse 7, it says this. Now, when they have finished their testimony. Come on, somebody say, finish their testimony. Finish their testimony. 
the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. And this is what we're talking about as Pastor Eric is mentioning. As you're going forward in deep convictions, it will feel like that you come to a point of sure death. That the vision is dead. That the progress is dead. That there's nothing else that can come from what God seemed to have promised you. And yet here you are still standing there. Look at verse 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet and terror struck those around them. Come on now, church. That's exactly what we need today. Just like it happened to these two witnesses who were dead and had to be resurrected by the very breath of God. And it struck fear into the hearts of the enemy. It is just like what will happen to Israel. For thousands of years, it looked like this promise was dead to them. There was no nation. There was nothing for them to inherit. And 70 years ago, we can start to see the very breath of life enter these people again. Amen. Amen. There is now a place, a land that they can come to. What about us today? What areas have you, have you started off in a conviction, but it has died? Not just looked like it died, not just feels like it died, it is dead. And you need the very breath of God to be breathed in you today. That you might stand up rightly on your feet. To have the same hope as these two witnesses. To have the same hope that the nation of Israel. To have the same hope as Caleb and Daniel and Abraham and Peter. Amen. What needs to be breathed in you today, church? Y'all want some hope this morning? Go to Romans chapter 11. We'll start in verse 13. You know, the inspiration, the joy, and the hope in this message is that we're looking at all the examples throughout the Bible and we're able to see this resurrection power at work. If it's at work within them, it can also be at work within us. Starting in verse 13. I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in hope. Everybody say hope. In hope. hope. That I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if the rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what would their acceptance be but life for from the dead? What we see in this passage is that there is still a hope of resurrection power for the nation of Israel. That even extends to every single Israelite throughout the entire Bible. And we also are grafted into that same hope to have resurrection power within us that results in an Israeli fire that burns bright. That Israeli fire was burning so bright that Abraham, who is the father of Israel, his faith, his convictions, they resurrected lives. He was willing to sacrifice a son. Caleb, an Israeli man, his faith resurrected promises. When it looked dead, it wasn't dead to Caleb. Daniel is an Israeli man whose fire teaches us that faith will resurrect our very resolve, our will. Peter is an Israeli man whose faith did all three of those things. Are you catching Israeli fire? What kind of man are you? You know, there are men in this place, men in this very room who can share revelation from the heaven to explain and to define what kind of man they are, like Keith Phillips. From Hebrews 1, 3, he has learned and he's been resurrected in his heart to know that God is not too vast to know, but that Jesus is able to be emulated and that he can, in fact, be what he sees in Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, there's Judah Stevens who from 2 Chronicles 14.11 has a conviction that there is no God like my God who helps me in my weakness. A man like Caleb Brown that was reading John 16.33 and heaven put a conviction in him that he no longer needs to be concerned about trouble because it's been promised that he has already overcome it if he can stand fast through it. Men like Nick Aragina who in Zechariah chapter 4 verses 8 through 10 He is reminded, he is awakened in his soul with the conviction that men will rejoice when they see him remaining faithful to an uncompromised standard as the grace of God works effectively within him. There's men like Spencer McLean who from 1 Corinthians 16, 13 find that they can courageously stand firm and be a man unmoved and planted in the house of God. I've watched men who were once shaky become steadfast because heaven's voice entered their ears. One of them is my youngest son, Gabriel. 
Out of Psalm 91, the Lord has spoken to him. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Gabriel now has a steadfast conviction that if he loves and acknowledges the Lord, even when he gets into trouble, the Lord will rescue him for acknowledging the Lord is the Savior of all men. Come on, men like Justin Treister. Who had a Job 14 in verse 7. It says, at least there is hope for a tree. Come on, somebody say hope. 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 If it's cut down, then it can spring and sprout again. Justin knows and has learned from the heavens that he can be an oak of righteousness. That buds and blossoms at just the scent of water feeding him from the very heavens. There's men like J.J. Moloch, who from Psalm 27 has a confidence that, I, that they will see the goodness of the Lord as He gives him life. Able to be certain of the outcome that God has promised. How is the Scripture dealing with your heart? We just shared with you the man who showed up to study with us in the morning. And we asked them, what has the God of heaven spoken to you? How did He speak it and what have you determined from it? Can you imagine they were as put on the spot as you were? We just read to you their answers. What do you know that you know God has said to you? Because the deeper your convictions get, 1 Thessalonians teaches us, we know that the gospel came to you. Because you didn't receive it in words only, but it came with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep convictions. When a man has heard from God, he stands the test. We started off five weeks ago talking to you about shimming the foundation. The reason that we were doing that is because we want your foundation position to hear from God. Then we looked at fine-tuning the faith of Abraham, learning to eliminate the assumptions of what you think God said from what you know God said. We moved on to an Israeli fire because we wanted you to catch the same fire that's been falling from heaven on people since the very beginning. Last week, we learned from our older brother and how you deal with the spirit of Beit Shin all around us and hold your convictions. This week, our closing is we're telling you that if you've heard from God, you don't renegotiate It's Caesarea Philippi. When standing in the face of such wanton sin all around us, Christians don't often just run off to the topless bar. Instead, they say, I think the Lord is leading me to something as wicked as the topless bar. And you say, how could they be? How could it be so wicked as that? Because if you're not where God said to be, doing what He said to be, you're not in His will. There is nothing in between there. See, a conviction will tell you, I must stand here. Not I do sometimes and I don't other times. Guys, it's heavenly convictions that will overcome the gates of hell. Consider that gates are a defensive structure. Our revelation is supposed to be attacking this world system, advancing against this world system, going into the temple of Pan and defeating it, tearing down Augustus Caesar's idol, removing Zeus's temple, and pushing forward with the kingdom of God. You can't do that if you're still wavering in insecurity. And this is why churches elect their heroes. They find one, two, three, four men with convictions. And those become their champions to go fight Goliath while they hide in the ranks. This is supposed to be a church of men with convictions. You can be here 10 years, 15 years, and still be surviving on the convictions of others. You know what you do when you're alone? What you do when no one is looking? What you would do if this church didn't exist at all? That tells you where your convictions are. We want to walk with you as you walk with the Lord. And we will carry you when you're injured, but we're not supposed to have to carry your calling. That's your job. Would you stand to your feet?
You preach a message like this to men and women that are called, to men and women that are loved of the Lord. This is not your standard salvation message. This is a message to the saved that says we must grow up into our head. We must. This is a message from leaders that believe you're supposed to accomplish something. You don't exist to support us. We exist to serve you so that you complete the work of God in your life. I'm not disappointed when somebody's in sin because it hurts the church. I'm not disappointed when somebody leaves because it hurts the church. I'm not disappointed when somebody's confused and slanders because it hurts the church. I'm disappointed because the kingdom now misses out on what they were supposed to accomplish. Each of us, the Lord spoke to me one sentence that changed my whole life. Each of us has the right to hear from God. And once you have, it ought to determine every day of the rest of your life. He spoke to me once and it was audible. He's never had to do that again. Not one time has he ever had to do that again. When the God of the universe gets hold of you, he ought not have to meet with you monthly to make sure that you're doing what he said. You ought to be meeting with him, but he ought not have to come and kick you off of your feet. I'm appealing to you as a pastor who loves you and believes that you are called to accomplish something. There's all kind of churches you can go to where they could care less what you do as long as you tithe. I care whether or not you meet the high call of God on your life. And these men care too. That's why we're preaching this. We're going to begin to worship. We're not asking you who do people say the Son of God is. We're asking you who He is to you. And if you have some pat theological answer, you and I both know how hollow that is. What has He spoken to you? What is His relationship to you in a real and tangible way that doesn't depend on anybody else? Because I can say flat-footed with you, if every one of you goes to hell, I will not go with you. I've heard from God. I cannot be pried out. How does that sit with your soul? If you hear from Him, then you'll be a rock that the kingdom has built on. And you'll prevail against hell. If hell has been prevailing against you, that tells you what you need to know. We're going to begin to pray. We're going to take our time in prayer. If you don't want to do that, I've been saying it for a long time and it's been a while since I just got it out there. You don't want to be here. We could use your seat. It's okay. Because God will bring in those who want this kind of message. If you don't want to be here, don't worry about it. We'll politely wave to you as you leave. But if you have a conviction from God that this is your family, then we'll stand against all the power of hell with you. Now's the time to seek the face of God. See what He is saying to you. And if nothing changes, then you didn't listen. Father, You are the revealer of mysteries. You are the one. You are the only rock. And Lord, you speak to broken and contrite men. Lord, would you speak to us? We're a broken and contrite church. Lord, a group of ragtag former rebels. One more time, Lord, would you speak from heaven to us? One more time, would you fall on the ears of the people? Lord, we don't just want to withstand the onslaught of hell. We want to attack it. We want to prevail against it. 
We want to have that different spirit that overcomes when others retreat. Spirit of God, would you move in this place upon us? Nothing's wrong with you. Everything is wrong with us. Come and move upon us. Change us, Lord. What you speak to us today will not be wasted. Lord, it won't be cast aside. We will stand on it for every day for the rest of our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray.